Meet the sheriffs. Let's go and introduce ourselves. Got an iCart route to attend here today. If it's not pie, we're going to be removing the stock. Their job is to get you your money back. It's about to get physical. It's the rest of all offence to stop me and do my job. If you've been ripped off and don't know where to turn... We need to deal with it now. We're going to remove vehicles to that value. If you're acting on his authority, pay it. If you've been to court but still not been paid what you're owed... Are you going to open this building, sir, or am I going to force entry into it? You need to pay this. It's time to call the sheriff. Put your hands on me. I'm going to call the locksmith. Effect entry into the premises and remove all the items. Whoa, 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 whoa. They're enforcement agents of the High Court, and the law says they're on your side. It's collected 42 grand. Today, Daryl and Craig have partnered up to visit a beauty salon, but they're not there to go wild with fake tans and pedicures. Go to a, a company called Urban Glow. It's an employment tribunal. I mean, just over £31,000, so he's a, he's a huge amount we're going to collect. This is the woman the sheriffs are trying to help, Victoria Lyle, a trained beautician and new mum from Rushall, Walsall. A year before her baby Kai was born, Victoria saw a beauty therapist job advertised at a local salon, Urban Glow, close to where her parents lived. Being passionate about beauty and makeup, she seized the opportunity and got the job. I was working from 9 o'clock in the morning, sometimes till 9 o'clock at night. And within two weeks, he'd promoted me to salon manager because he said he was that impressed with my work and how I interacted with the clients. And I was over the moon. Four months later, Victoria and her fiancé, Chris, discovered she was 10 weeks pregnant. She told her boss. Initially, he was pleased and congratulated Victoria and her family on the good news. But only four days later, he dismissed her. It completely tore me apart. I just didn't know what we were going to do. What made it worse was the manner in which she was dismissed. Instead of telling Victoria face to face, the salon boss told Victoria's mum instead, who at the time was working part time as the salon's receptionist. And a text message. He said, um, can't keep her, she's pregnant, lol. It's quite obvious why, why he fired me, because I was pregnant. Being dismissed was just the start of Victoria and her family's problems. She visited the Urban Glow Salon, hoping to collect £800 worth of personal equipment that she had put into the business. However, the salon owner had other ideas and refused to let her inside. It was a freezing cold day, it had been snowing, and he'd locked the he locked the door and left me out on the pavement crying. Victoria called the police, who assisted her in collecting her things from the premises. The stress of the situation led Victoria into depression. I found it hard to get out of bed. I was that low and that down. My partner would come home from work and I'd be, I'd be in tears every day. Victoria started having problems with her pregnancy. I was admitted to hospital on two occasions because I was in early labour, which they managed to stop. But it, they said it was due to all the stress. Luckily, Victoria had the support of her family and, with her father's help, she found strength to take her former boss to court. The salon boss didn't appear in court to contest the case. Here we go. The judge found that his behaviour had led to Victoria's stress and that he dismissed her because she was pregnant. Her former boss was ordered to pay her over £27,000 for loss of wages, stress and discrimination. When the judge informed us of the judgment that he was making and the amount that it was for, I was just thinking, you know, I don't have to worry now, I can provide for my little boy. And now this judgment is made, I won't have to see him again, I won't have to face him, the court case is over. Um, it was just a relief, that pressure had been lifted. But Victoria didn't feel relief for long. Despite the court order, her former boss still hasn't paid her the money. She's left with only one option. I don't know what to do, so the sheriffs are our only option, really, are our last resort. It's now up to the sheriffs to get Victoria and baby Kai the money they're owed. Daryl and Craig have arrived at Urban Glow with the massive task of recovering a debt that, with interest and costs, 
is now £31,000. Hello. Oh, sorry. Is the uh, manager about at all? Yeah, if your boss is here, yeah, thank you. Is that him, is he? Yeah. Oh. Victoria's former boss is soon on the line. I've actually sent us out to execute a high court writ today. It's an employment tribunal case. He asks Craig to go into the back of the shop so he doesn't disturb the customers. It's, what, it's been what, sorry? Then he asks the sheriffs to leave altogether. We can't go outside the shop, sir. We're authorised to execute the high court writ whilst we're here. Well, I can, sir. Quite simply, I've got a court order to execute whilst I'm here. No problem. I'll wait for your call. While they wait for the salon boss, Daryl realises they've got a problem. The debt is £31,000. But even though there are some fairly valuable sunbeds, the assets in the shop are worth nothing like that amount. Just then, the owner arrives. Hello, sir. Gonna leave? Hello, oh, sir. Gonna leave? No. We can discuss it. We're but not there's leaving. There's no discussing it. This has gone to tribunal. Okay, case has been referred by the judge. Right, so at the moment we've got a live writ. But as far as I'm aware... Well, you, as far as you might be aware, that may be it, but it's... What, what's it? What, what are you filming? Can you stop I, filming? I don't want I'm, you to film, mate. The salon boss strongly objects to our presence. Take your hat, don't touch the camera, sir. It'll be assault sir. if you touch me again. But you can ask me to leave and I'll leave. I don't want my... We can uh, just... Take the he's, camera in place. He's, gonna, he's just told face. you he will leave. Still running so everyone can hear what's So going. let him leave. With us gone, he then tells Daryl and Craig that he's appealing the judgement, so doesn't think the sheriffs should be there either. Craig points out that an appeal does not prevent his right to enforce the writ today. Despite this, the salon boss still refuses to pay up. Bit of a brick wall at the moment. They've not tried to raise any money, made no attempt to raise any money, just keep saying they ain't got it, they got 300 quid, and they're still on the phone to the solicitors. With no money on the table, Craig looks into calling a removal truck. Just then, the boss's wife arrives. She says the sunbeds can't be removed because they're rented and don't belong to the company. Without the valuable sunbeds to raise even a fraction of the £31,000, the sheriffs would have to clear out the salon, stopping Urban Glow from doing business. Rather than see the salon effectively closed, the couple finally start to look for funds. They come up with £5,000 over the next couple of days. Uh, we've got a part payment today of uh, £3,000, um, with a further £2,000 being paid tomorrow. That's not bad, start chipping away at it. A good result to get that amount of money off a, off a liability of this size. It may not be the full amount, but £5,000 in the Sheriff's Bank is worth more than all the salon's assets sold at auction. You going to mug me? I might have got to mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veeley now. We've got this little one and we've got the great news that what the sheriffs have done, so we're just so happy now. The salon boss disputes Victoria Lyle's version of events, saying he did not dismiss her because she was pregnant, but because he had to make redundancies and she was the most recent appointment. He denied he sent the offensive text message, saying he believed another ex-employee had used his phone to make the text. He says she only worked for him for two and a half months and therefore was dismissed within her probationary period. After filming, Urban Glow agreed to pay Victoria £250 a month to clear the debt. However, they've since stopped making the payments, saying the business is now closed. The sheriffs are continuing to chase the company director for payment. On the road today, sheriffs Lawrence Grix and Kev McNally are heading east from London for a date with a company who haven't paid one former employee the money he's entitled to. We're in Kent and we're on our way to Mercury Windows Limited. Their latest assignment is on behalf of a man who, having worked at Mercury Windows for over 10 years, was dismissed without warning or notice pay. He doesn't want to be identified. He took his case to court where the company contested it fully, but the judge agreed with the former employee and ordered Mercury Windows to pay him £6,800 in compensation, which the company has failed to do. Oh, here we 
Mercury. Now it's a matter for the sheriffs. Arriving at the company headquarters, Lawrence and Kev park up and head in. Hello, mate. Hello, they're Mercury Windows Limited. We've got a high court writ to the value of £8,188.49. pence. So we're looking to remove goods to sell them at auction. Nothing's owned by Mercury Windows. Straight away, the staff member tells them, although this is the company's registered address, nothing at the site belongs to Mercury Windows. Unsurprisingly, Lawrence isn't convinced and demands to speak to the company director. Hello, sir. Yeah, my name's Mr. Griggs. I'm here with a High Court writ. The boss is quick to say that as no assets there are registered to Mercury Windows, there's nothing the sheriffs can list and remove to cover the company's debt to its former employee. Lawrence explains it's not quite that simple. Unless there's proof to back up his story, this enforcement to recover the money owed to the former employee is going ahead as planned. We would need confirmation. Um, my, my colleague's going to take an inventory anyway. He's started doing that now. Anything on these premises that's got any value, if it's not owned by Mercury Windows, it's down to whoever does own it to prove that they own it. So who owns, who owns the assets here? Tut Hill Property Limited. And are you a director of Tut Hill Properties Limited as well? Lawrence's grilling of the company director is quickly giving him an idea of what's happened here. All the assets at the Mercury Windows base have been transferred to another company, which the boss also happens to be a director of, Tut Hill Property Limited. This is perfectly legal and could be bad news for the sheriffs, but Lawrence isn't ready to back down yet. Go and there's a financial trail to show that as well, where one company bought the assets from the other, is there? Yeah, because it needs to be it needs to be a full inventory of what was transferred. You just can't just be 15 desks, five computers. Everything has to be detailed specifically. Yeah, I mean, if you're able to get that to us, that, that'll be a start, and then we can obviously exclude things that are on your list. OK. Thanks. Bye-bye. He's going to email it over here. While they wait for the promised proof to arrive, Lawrence holds fort in the office as Kev finishes his list of potentially removable assets. In cases like these, the smallest details can be the difference between payment in full and leaving empty-handed. Perfectionist Lawrence has high standards for Kev to live up to when it comes to listing assets. No reg on the forklift, no? No. No name on the Groover machine? No. Get as much down as you can, mate. Just so they can be identified. A few minutes later, an email arrives with the boss's own inventory of the assets he claims have been sold by Mercury Windows to his other company. Lawrence isn't impressed. It's time for another phone call to the boss. Um, we've, we've seen your inventory. I don't know if your guy has told you. Unfortunately, as, as from our point of view, it's not worth the paper it's written on. If you were buying a car, you wouldn't expect to receive from a car dealer saying a vehicle, would you? You know, it's, uh, there needs to be some way of, of proving what is what. Well, it's got on it a forklift, for example. Because I've just said, how, how can you prove to me that that's the forklift that's out there now? But today, he's facing an adversary whose attention to detail rivals his own. It's photographs of everything, is there? That, that's what we need to see. We need to see the photographs. Cheers. Bye. Apparently there's photos to go with all the items on the inventory. Later, we'll find out if these photos are the proof Lawrence needs to see to prevent the company assets leaving with the sheriffs. I can see that you've already tried to transfer the assets out into the name of another company. Or whether the former employee gets back the money he's owed. Enforcement agents, commonly known as sheriffs, can go anywhere in England and Wales to enforce a High Court writ. The court ordered you to pay, didn't it, sir? Well, yes, it did. Sheriffs have collected almost £200 million in unpaid court judgments in the last three years. The total due today is £11,757.96. Right. That's the reason for our visit. How would you like to pay? A High Court writ costs £60. 
If the sheriffs are successful, there's nothing more to pay. If they're unsuccessful, the only cost is a compliance fee of £75 plus VAT for each enforcement. This morning, sheriffs Mark Newton and Tony Smith have got up early and driven through the dark for an early appointment with a South Coast car dealer. I'm off to address him, uh, Bournemouth, sort of quarter to seven in the morning. We're looking for an amount of £4,044. Hopefully give him an early morning knock and uh, we'll get some sort of answer. The person they're on their way to help is Karen Wildman of Bournemouth. When she decided to sell her car, she thought it would raise a few pounds for her and her family. But her decision to sell it through a particular local dealer has instead left her in a dispute so serious it's forced her to the court and to the door of the sheriffs for help. Mother of two, Karen, works for the local council. 18 months ago, she decided to upgrade her wheels and invested in a second-hand Volvo XC90 4x4 to help transport her family. It meant she no longer needed her old car, her Ford Galaxy. Looking round to sell it, she spoke to the dealer that had sourced her new Volvo, the boss of JL Trade Group Limited. He said what he would do is he'd sell the car for me take £500 commission and um, obviously give me the rest. Um, I agreed to that. He came round, I gave him the keys, all the paperwork, and um, he went off with the Galaxy. Thinking the dealer was in the process of trying to sell her Galaxy, Karen thought no more of it, until a few weeks later, she got a letter. And then I got a letter through the post from the DVLA to say that I was no longer the registered owner of the Galaxy. And then I thought, well, well that's strange, because he's obviously sold my car and not told me, and I just couldn't believe it. I didn't want to believe it, because obviously, if I believed it, then I'd know instantly that I'd lost £4,500. Karen got in touch with the dealer, who confirmed to her that he had sold her car for £4,500 but that the person who'd bought it wasn't happy with it and wanted his money back. It meant, he said, he couldn't afford to pay Karen. He said, oh, sorry, Karen, I'm so sorry. Didn't want to worry you with it. I've been trying to deal with it on my own, but there's lots of problems with the car. The person that's bought it isn't very happy and he wants his money back. And, you know, I just, just don't want to worry you with it, but I'll sort it out and I'll be in touch. So I said, well, basically, you've sold the car from your business. As far as I'm concerned, that's a deal. I just want my money. Karen arranged to visit the dealer to discuss the problem with him, but far from resolving things, the meeting made them worse. I said, can I have my money? I trusted you as a professional to sell my car. I trusted you to do the checks. I trusted you to prepare it for the sale. And I trusted you to make sure that your customer was happy. I said, how can that be my fault that your sell has fallen through and that I end up having to pay it. I said, I don't understand that. And he said, well, you know, um, I can't afford to lose any money. I said, I can't afford to lose any money. I said, I've given you eight and a half thousand pounds for a Volvo already. I said, I can't afford to give you another four and a half thousand pounds just because you didn't do your job properly. Take what I owe you and then send me a check. So we shook hands. He said, oh, there'll be a check to you, out to you in the end of the week. But the dealer's check never materialised. Two weeks, no check. Phoned his mobile, he didn't answer. Um, sent him a text message, he ignored it. So then I realised that he wasn't going to pay me. I started to really panic then. I thought, oh no, they're not going to pay me for the car. So I contacted my solicitor, and my solicitor wrote a letter saying, you know, can we have the money for the car? You've sold the car, just send Karen the money. He ignored the letter. My solicitor wrote again saying, if you don't pay for the car, then we will take legal action. But she still didn't get any money from the dealer. Karen decided she had no option but to go through the daunting process of taking him to court. I have to admit that some nights I've gone to bed and I haven't slept, and I've woken up at three in the morning, four in the morning, um, you know, feeling annoyed and annoyed with myself, annoyed that 
I'd lost this money, you know, for me and my family. Just determined to get my money. The dealer fought the case in court, but the judge agreed with Karen and ordered him to pay her £3,000. Despite this, Karen still not received a penny. Now Karen's last hope of getting her money back rests with Sheriff's Mark and Tony. Arriving at the registered address of JL Trade Group Limited, not to be confused with any other business of a similar name, they find a number of potentially removable vehicles parked on the drive. It's a positive sign. Time to introduce themselves. Hiya. This is a High Court writ that's been issued by a Karen Wellman. Right. Yeah. Right. We've been sent here today to collect the money. It's the dealer's partner. She admits she's aware of the debt, but says her name shouldn't be on the writ. She says they've applied to have the judgment set aside. For Mark, though, this doesn't change the situation. At this stage, it's not, it's not set aside. It's, it's, a live, it's a live writ. It's nothing to do with me. We're getting my name put, taken off of it. My partner has been in contact with the court. So but like, as, as I explained, this is still a live writ, which means we, we can still act on it today, unfortunately. You'd need to pay it. Um, we haven't got the means to pay it in yeah. full at all. The woman says they don't have the money and isn't prepared to let the sheriffs in. If you're not in a financial position, we're going to have to take goods away. This is where we are today. Well, how do we get on? Because I'm not prepared to let you in then. Okay, we'll be taking vehicles off the drive then. Well, those vehicles, they're not in our name. With Mark and Tony's attention turning to the vehicles on the drive, the dealer himself appears at the door. He explains none of the vehicles belong to him and so can't be removed to pay his debt to Karen. We don't have the documents for the vehicles, so check with DVLA. We don't, they sell or return. I'm a car dealer. Check with DVLA, do number plate checks, and you'll see they're not on our name. I have contracts, have got contracts with, with private individuals to sell things. If this is true, without the leverage the cars provide, this assignment just got a lot harder for the sheriffs. Mark decides to go on the offensive. Obviously, this is in your name personally, not it's your... It's in my name, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. So I'm, a, I'm a sole so, trader, so... Yeah. I mean, can you do anything today? Yeah, would... would yeah. What would you need? Well, something reasonable. Well, yeah, something reasonable. When you say reasonable... Well, I mean, well, well can you do a £1,000 today? No. Absolutely not. I don't even have that in my bank. So what are you saying you can do? I can do £500 today. It's a start. As the dealer's partner goes to get the money out from the bank, Mark and Tony hold a quick strategy meeting. She's gone off to get some money out of the cash point for us. Um, they're going to pay some money, not, not what we want. We obviously like the whole amount, but... To be honest, if we can get them paying, it, it obviously helps with our whole case of, you know, you've started to pay now, so let's keep it going. His partner returns with the promised £500 in cash and the car dealer hands it over. Now the challenge is to convince him to sort out the rest of Karen's money. You need, you need to put in sort of what you've got incoming and what you've got outgoing, yeah, and explain this is what you can pay, yeah? 400 then. 500, yeah, 500. The car dealer agrees to work out exactly how much he can afford and then make Karen an offer to clear the debt in monthly instalments. Keep the payments going. Uh, once you, you've set this arrangement, keep it going, yeah? And well, yeah, that's what so I want to... Get it cleared off. We've listed that vehicle because obviously you can't provide proof that it isn't yours. We want to send in the proof yeah, when yeah, you I get it that, with yeah, that, yeah? yeah. yeah. With the car dealer promising to keep paying Karen back and acknowledging he must provide proof that none of the vehicles on his drive are owned by him, Mark and Tony have done all they can for today. Hopefully you'll just get paid and we won't see you again, but if you know you've got any problems, you give me a call, yeah? All right, thank you. No problem, bye-bye. We've got the guy paying, you know, obviously he hasn't paid anything for over six months and at least we've got some money off him this morning. So at least we've got, we've got the wheels in motion now, which is, is good. Finally for Karen, it looks like her long ordeal may be coming to an end. Right, I got a letter this to say that I managed to collect the sum of £500 cash, which is a good start. I'm quite optimistic. 
And since we filmed, the car dealer is continuing to make monthly payments to Karen to pay off the debt. Lawrence and Kev are still at Mercury Windows Limited in Kent, trying to get a former employee the unpaid wages a court says he's owed. Earlier, Lawrence spoke to the company director, who claimed that all the assets on the premises had been sold to Tut Hill Property Limited, a company he's also the director of. Lawrence was less than convinced of his story and demanded proof. When the director sent through an inventory of these items, Lawrence's suspicions only deepened. Unfortunately, as, as from our point of view, it's not worth the paper it's written on. If you were buying a car, you wouldn't expect to receive from a car dealer saying a vehicle, would you? You know, it's, uh, there needs to be some way of, of proving what is what. But the director then claimed to also have photos that could positively match every item on his list to the assets on the premises, therefore proving the transfer was genuine. Stickler for detail, Lawrence now wants to see every photo. If you can go back to the first picture, so I can see the two air compressors. But with the photos matching up to the assets on the boss's list, it's looking like Lawrence will have to admit defeat here. Yeah, two microsaws, yeah. However, he's got one last card to play. What I need to see now is the bank statement showing these amounts either separately or together going between the two different companies. Lawrence listens with bated breath as the staff member calls his boss again. Are they saying, can you go on and do the online banking and show where this money's been paid? If the Mercury Windows director can provide proof of the transaction, this enforcement is dead and buried. It hasn't been paid. It's owed. Right, okay. Right. We're taking it then. It's the breakthrough the sheriffs desperately needed. Despite the assets being transferred from Mercury Windows to the other company, no money has passed between them. Hello, sir. Lawrence takes over the call to tell the director. As far as he's concerned, the sale is null and void. Then the goods are going, sir, because they still belong to Mercury Windows. No, the good, it's still be, it, all, it all still belongs to Mercury Windows. Yes, it does. You've now admitted to me that funds were never transferred, this bit invoice has never been paid. Those assets still belong to Mercury Windows. Well, it doesn't matter. They've, they've never been purchased. Sensing victory, he turns the pressure up. I'll, I'll tell you what this is, sir. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quite blunt with you. This is a, an attempt at transferring assets to defeat paying this debt, isn't it? It was that, the, the transfer pay, the, the transfer pay, the transfer paperwork was drawn up three days before the tribunal. I can see that you've already tried to transfer the assets out into the name of another company. So I now believe the goods to be in jeopardy. So I will be removing them today. At this point, the director performs a major U-turn and says he'd like to pay in full. Not, not a problem. We've caught, we catch everybody by surprise. <laughs> I have, yeah. Bye bye. Lawrence's attention to detail has got the desired effect. Right, thank you, Dougie. Here we go. Time to bring out the trusty chip and pin machine. There's that one. There's the receipt. With the full amount owed to the former employee collected, it's a superb result for the sheriffs. Thanks, gents. Cheers. Cheers, guys. See you later. Yeah. Yeah. Bye bye. Dealing with a sheriff of Lawrence's experience, not having all your documents in place is asking for trouble. Unfortunately for the uh, for the debtor company, the assets had never been transferred. The money had never um, never actually been paid. So you know the transfer just effectively hadn't happened. The goods still belong to the original debtor company, which prompted the director to pay in full over uh, three cars. <laughs> The East End of London, the beating heart of the capital's business activity, a melting pot of London life. And today it's where sheriffs Mark and Tony are headed, on their way to help out a lady let down by a letting agent.
Michelle Fenner is a local councillor in the seaside town of Broadstairs in Kent. It's a beautiful part of the world where she brought up her son Philippe after moving from her native France. But after recently graduating from university, Philippe decided to leave Kent and lay down roots in London. He planned to do bar work to subsidise his real ambition of becoming an illustrator. He's always been uh, passionate about drawing. The minute he was able to, to hold a pen when he was little, he started drawing. And it was so good that he was able to uh, do a degree uh, in illustration. And uh, there he was, he was going to um, use that in his professional life. You know, we want to do everything we can to help him uh, achieve that. Philippe got himself a job and agreed to flat share with some friends. They soon found an apartment in East London, being rented through a local lettings agency, Madison Brook. Happy with it, Michelle agreed to stump up the £1,200 deposit and holding fee for Philippe. All he had to do now was move in, which Madison Brook told him would be in September. We had uh, the address of Madison Brooks, we had their, their details in terms of bank account, etc. It was all apparently above the board. Um, there was no reason for me to, to be um, suspicious of, of any wrongdoing. But September came and went, and so did the moving in date. Despite chasing Madison Brook for news, neither he nor Michelle could get any date at all for moving in. Desperately needing accommodation so he could begin his job, Philippe and Michelle decided they had no choice but to pull out of the flat. Expecting the swift return of her deposit, Michelle was philosophical about the problem. I was concerned, I was disappointed, but um... At the same time, thinking, well, these sort of things do happen. While Philippe went looking for a new flat, Michelle waited to get her £1,200 back. And waited. And waited. But nothing came. Despite being assured by Madison Brook that the money would be returned, not a penny came her way. They cashed the money. Uh, it was a bank transfer, so the money was on their account immediately so they could start using it uh, however they, they wanted. Uh, they chose to keep it uh, wrongly. I just think that they're so arrogant. Uh, they just really uh, are, are treating people badly. Uh, it's, a, it's a total lack of, of respect. Eight months after pulling out of the flat and still without her money, Michelle took Madison Brook to court but the letting agent failed to attend. The judge ruled in Michelle's favour and ordered Madison Brook to pay her back, in full. But to date, Michelle has still not received a penny. No, we do care. It's a lot of money for us. If Michelle's to get any of her money back, her only hope now rests with sheriffs Mark and Tony. But before they can get any money from them, Mark and Tony have got to find the Madison Brook office. And in the dense lanes of London's Docklands, that's not proving easy. Number 20. Number 20, Unit 8. Unit B. Unit B. Just love numbers to go. 4, 15, 2. <laughs> it might be 15 to Unit, though. That's 2. What are we after? 20. Unable to find it in the van, Mark decides on a more traditional method. Look, there's a map there. So we can look on the map. Where are we? There, I think. We're up there. Just back there. That says 14, doesn't it? See, that's unit 20. Not even on there, are they? We're going to ask them what number. I don't know if there's anyone in there. Oh, uh, yeah, there might be. Can local knowledge help where everything else has failed? Mark and Tony flash their sheriff credentials, and the people inside are only too happy to help. Turns out, the sheriffs don't have far to go. Oh yeah, there, yeah, look. It'd be there. Mark and Tony navigate all the way around the corner where they find the office. They head in. 
This is Madison Brook Docklands Letting Agency. Yeah. It's about a High Court writ that's been issued. Some outstanding money. Um, we're here to collect it today. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So far, so good. They're in, and they've been offered a seat. Soon after, a manager arrives. It's to do with a. Uh, I'll just give you your paper. A writ that's been issued against. Yeah, that's yours anyway. That's yours anyway. Yeah, no problem. The manager heads off to study the writ. On a typical day for the sheriffs, it's rare they get any time to relax. So Mark and Tony take the opportunity to browse the glossies. Aston Martin. <laughs> 560 pounds. They're an Aston Martin trainer. Well, it probably ain't got our size anyway. But before they've had a chance to get a shopping list together, the manager's back with some news. That's done for me, aren't you? Oh, you paid it into our on buy that. To Mark's surprise, and with no arguments at all, the managers transferred the money in full, there and then, into the sheriff's account. Which means Michelle finally getting the cash she's owed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's spot on. All right. And that's yours. All right, lovely. No problem. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you. Bye bye. It's been as easy a job as it ever gets for the sheriffs, and Mark is understandably delighted. That was an amazing result, to be honest, because we was literally in there no more than 10 minutes. Um, the guy said the name, he had a vague memory of the name, went off. I was expecting him to come back and question it or deny all knowledge, and literally came back with the thing to say that he transferred the money, and it's all done. Um, to be honest, I, I'm amazed. <laughs> I was a bit in shock when he came back and went, it's paid. But the real winner has been Michelle Fenner, who's finally received the £1,652, including all additional legal costs, that was rightfully hers. It was good that they were able to go in, get the money. Thank you very much, goodbye. <laughs> it's gone straight into the bank and uh, it was needed there, no doubt. Really, the lesson is to, to persist. You know you're right and you've just got to keep at it until, until you get what you, what you want and what is really rightfully owed to you. The sheriffs often find themselves in the middle of disputes between businesses that are far from straightforward. This afternoon, Lawrence and Kev are en route to one such case with a High Court writ to enforce against a London greengrocers. We're going to, to a, a company called Ornek Limited, trading, trading as 1001 Supermarket. The claimant is their accountants, so obviously uh, not paid their accountants bill. The total we've got due is £2,459.34. Given the limited shelf life for most grocery items, Lawrence has a clear idea what goods they'll be looking to remove today. I would imagine the main assets will be um, wet stock and possibly cigarettes. In a city full of convenience stores, finding the right shop could prove tricky. What number do we want? 342 to 344. 262, so we're on the right. Supermarket, 1001, that's, that's it. One, that's it. And there's a space. Time to park up and introduce themselves to the boss. Hello there, sir. You, you're the boss. My name's Mr. Griggs. I come here today to execute a High Court writ against Ornek Limited, trading as a 1001 supermarket. Well, I'm here today to remove goods to the value of £2,459.34. pence. The only way to prevent further action is to pay in full. How much is that? £2,459.34. pence. It's what for? Well, it's for your unpaid, unpaid accountants bill, I would imagine, being as the claimant is your accountants. So have you not paid your accountants? Yeah, of course I've paid accountants. Well, they've, they've got judgment against you for £1,567.19, which they've transferred up to the High Court for enforcement purposes. And with all the additional costs, it's now at £2,459.34. Can we... I speak to my accountant? Sorry? Can I call them my accountant? Yeah, sure. Yeah, start with the wet stop, mate. They've got a wet stop behind the counter over there. As the seemingly confused man goes to call the new accountant he now uses, Kev gets on with listing the shop's prime assets. 
Oh, I got fags as well, Kev. We're asked to leave, but continue filming from the street. The store boss tells Lawrence he knows nothing about the judgment against him and hasn't received any letters about it. But this doesn't affect Lawrence's enforcement, which will go ahead either way. It looks like this shop's window could soon be emptied. Then the shop's new accountant calls with an offer for Lawrence to pay the debt by check. But the sheriffs don't take checks. Lawrence lets them know he needs cleared funds or the stock is going. This tough stance has the desired effect. The boss finally agrees to pay in full, in cash. It's another payment in the bag for Lawrence and Kev with a minimum of fuss. There's just one problem. How do we get a parking ticket? Ah, oh, I'll put an hour on it. We've been an extra half hour. I'll grab that off him. Despite this unexpected expense, it's still been a good afternoon's work for the sheriffs. We've got paid in full. We've got a parking ticket for our trouble. Lawrence explains this may not be the last they hear from a thousand and one supermarket. What he was saying was it was two firms of accountants and they merged together and then they split or something. And he'd ended up paying both firms. He, he says he's going to get it back off them, take his own legal action against them because he's paid twice. And I've told him where to come to get the judgment enforced. If they don't pay him, we could end up getting this same bit of money going backwards and forwards a few times. It's a positive result for the sheriffs from a potentially tricky job. A paid in full means the people they've come to collect for will finally get the money a court says is rightfully theirs.